welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. God said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foamed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadowlark. So God made a farmer. Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornbro, and glad you're with me again today. And uh, I know, hey, it's been a little while since I did a podcast, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes. But uh, I think we've got a great one for you today. Uh, we're going to talk about creating and utilizing microclimates. And I think that this would be really beneficial for those who are urban homesteading or maybe just really limited on space. But I think even if you're on a larger scale homestead, uh, this can this can be huge for you. I mean, it can make a way for you to grow things that perhaps you may not normally be able to grow in your zone. We'll we'll talk all about that when we get to it. But um, I think it'd be a great show, and it's a it's a great thing to know a lot about as a homesteader. So, hey, let's just jump right in with some homestead updates. And uh, the big question on a lot of people's mind has been, uh, where you been? And uh, it has been a couple what three months now since so I did a podcast and. Um, yeah, I haven't really been on social media at all, hardly. I've done just minimal things on there. Uh, I'm a, uh, if someone tags me on Facebook or something like that, I reply. Or if I need to add some people to our Facebook group, uh, I've answered very few emails. I haven't sent out but maybe one newsletter in the last couple months. And there's a reason for all that. And the big reason is I wanted to take a break from it. <laughs> and uh, and I think it did me some good. Uh, sometimes I think you just need to step back and uh, have a little reality check on how much time you're really spending doing these things. And uh, I pretty much just laid off the internet uh, for uh, about 90% uh, in the last couple months. And and it, I think it did me some good. I enjoyed it. Um, at the same time, I do want to do this podcast. And, and uh, I think coming around to that realization, uh, part of that was I wrote a couple articles in the last couple months uh, at the blog. And... Um, one was, you know, reasons. It, it had in it reasons why I homestead. And uh, and then the second one I wrote was basically my story of how I got into homesteading, why we started doing it. And, uh, you know, those things helped me do like a reality check. And it's like, why do you want to do this? And uh, part of that reason is that I want to I want to encourage others to, to go down this path. So I want to continue uh, doing as much as I can, but within reason, because uh, I have this... Uh, <laughs> A mental disorder where I uh, I take on about ten times more than I'm physically capable of doing, and uh, and I try it for a long, long time to the point where I'm uh, really tired and really wore out, and uh, it's something I've done all my life on everything I ever take on. I always overdo it to the extreme, and uh, so I'm gonna try to be a little more casual about it and uh, do it when I can, and no promises. But, uh, you know, try to do one weekly when I can, and it probably won't be. And I'll just throw that out there as a reality right now, and that I'll do it when I can. And, uh, you know, I'm going to get back to being more active, uh, especially in the Facebook group and uh, Instagram probably especially. And, uh, you know, I may not respond to a lot of the emails I got the last couple months. I may just let them slide because I got quite a few and uh, it'd take me a while to go through and respond to all those. But, hey, I appreciate those of you who have missed the podcast and, and those of you who are uh, were concerned, wondering if everything was okay. And it, it was. I just wanted to take a little break and um, had a lot going on this summer. You know, I've got a grandson now, and uh, one of my other daughters is now uh, halfway through her pregnancy, and that's going to be a granddaughter. So I'm going to be a, a, a grandpa to a granddaughter and a grandson. And so I'm looking forward to that, but uh, it has definitely um, uh, taken a lot more of my time <laughs> than I thought it was going to, but it's time well spent, and I don't regret it at all. So that's where I've been. Uh, hopefully we can uh, keep up the pace here a little bit and keep some podcasts coming to you. I really enjoy uh, uh, interacting with all you good folks, uh, homesteaders, and those who are um, looking to become homesteaders, and uh, I really enjoy our uh, our time together here and in Facebook and other places. So uh, that's where I've been. Also, uh, see, right this time of the year, we're planting a lot of fall crops around here. So, um, spinach, uh, more kale, uh, more lettuce. I, I keep the lettuce going. As a matter of fact, I'll talk about that here in a little bit, kind of year-round, really, for the lettuce. 
um, beets, anything fast growing. I'm um, starting for a fall crop, and we just started last week and this week. I'll be planting some more today and uh, kind of trying to get a good crop in for fall as things have been uh, yanked out of the ground. My potatoes are done. Got a decent crop of those. Uh, onions done. Got a great crop of those. Uh, tomatoes are, well, tom- <laughs> that, that's another thing. This year's tomato crop, um, I, I, I do a couple things to try to minimize the chances of blight. And, and that is, one, as I, I, you know, I don't. Uh, water from above. I generally ground water. Um, I do separate my plants. I don't kind of monocrop my tomatoes. I plant a few here, a few there. I separate them. I intermix them with other things. I try to keep them separated so if one or two get blight, it won't spread. Well, we had some just crazy weather this year, and the rain was just, we'd get it in bucketfuls, and then it wouldn't rain for a few days, and then we just get dumped on again to where it was flooding the yard even. And, um, and I just, I couldn't beat the blight. And uh, so now everything that's outside, I mean, I'm still getting some production off of them, but they're hit with the blight pretty good. And uh, there's not a lot I can do about it. It's already uh, it's already kind of passed. Uh, but I have got a, a decent amount of, of tomatoes so far, but I think those are about done. The good news is, though, when I finished up um, starting all my seeds in the greenhouse this year, uh, in the bottom of each side, all the way down the sides, I just built... Uh, beds and I have removable shelves so I took the shelves out and I just let solid tomatoes I just planted nothing but tomatoes down each side and I let them just kind of fill the greenhouse up and those because they're in the greenhouse and didn't get affected by the rain I've watered them from the bottom they're doing great and I'm going to have hundreds of tomatoes uh, out of there so uh, I'm very thankful for the greenhouse and not only was it great for starting my my seeds this year and and getting a good start on transplants um, it's still benefiting me as far as uh, defending me from the blight uh, this year in in that area so be yanking a lot of tomato plants out of the ground today and kind of relying on on the uh, the greenhouse to supply the rest of my tomatoes this year but other than that it's going pretty good around here um, I think that uh, I think the homestead probably not having a good a crop this year as it did last year I think last year was just a bumper year I had a great uh, great year last year, and I, I, I took some chances this year, and I planted, planted a little more variety and a little less bulk of a few things, and I think that didn't pay off for me too well because I just didn't get tons of the stuff I usually get, but I'm still getting a lot of green beans, a lot of cucumbers. Um, like I said, the onions, I had, a, I had the best onion crop ever this year, and the potatoes weren't bad either. I did pretty good on the potatoes, so... Um, still getting a few peppers, but I've been really disappointed in the peppers this year. I think the, the rain, uh, had a lot to do with that as well. So, uh, doing pretty well. Animals doing great. Uh, quail getting lots of eggs and I butchered a few and rabbits are doing good. I've been breeding those and I've been alternating my breeding just a few weeks apart. And, and, um, that way I, as I'm butchering, uh, one, uh, litter, um, Right about, you know, within another week or two, uh, the next litter's uh, being weaned, and I can get them moved over to where the others were, and I get a nice rotation of meat rabbits uh, going in the freezer that way. Without a lot of, um, I mean, I've only got uh, two breeding does, and I'm just kind of rotating them, and I'm probably going to be breeding them about three times a year at this rate, and that, that's going to be enough uh, enough meat for us. As far as rabbit meat goes, um, between that and the quail and the eggs and whatnot, and we it, it isn't as though that's our sole meat source. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, that's pretty much what's going on around here, and uh, you know a lot of other little things. But uh, you know, it's been one of them years. I I started out this year thinking this was going to be the best year, most productive year for for my homestead, for my website, for my podcast. I was just this was going to be the year that we really broke loose on everything and just really blew up. And uh, as most of you know, who who uh, you know been in contact with me on Facebook or been listening to the podcast for a long time, we had a lot of things happen this year. I mean, we had deaths in the family, we had sicknesses, we had just uh, serious situations. We had the birth of a grandchild. We, we've just had thing after thing after thing happening this year. And it is, it has really been one of the craziest years of my life. So we're taking it all in stride. Uh, a lot of it's good. Lot, there's been some bad things for sure. And, uh, all in all though, uh, it, it's a, it's an okay year. You know, we're doing okay with everything. And, uh, and I think it's we're still going to do good on our crops this year. And, um, you know, we don't solely rely on that. We're not 100% uh, 
uh, self-sufficient from our gardens and, and, and our meat production here. We do go to the grocery store. We buy quite a bit from the grocery store still. And uh, so it isn't as though we completely rely on that. But I try to uh, get as much as I can for health reasons and uh, it saves money too. And, 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 you know, we try to do as much as we can from from our homestead. But all in all, I'm not super disappointed, but not the best year we've ever had either. So there's kind of the updates from the homestead. How about some homestead relevant news? I ran across a couple articles I was kind of excited about. Uh, this first one was uh, actually an article in mensjournal.com. And uh, I, I find that interesting because the, the title of the article is What Exactly is Permaculture? And here we have a, a men's journal. I mean, it's something that's not gardening. It's not homesteading. Yet they're talking about permaculture. And to me, that's exciting. They're talking about sustainable living. They're talking about uh, what permaculture is and, and, and how it makes a difference in society and it makes a difference for your self-sufficiency. Um, and they really just get down to a lot about sustainable gardening and farming using permaculture. And um, all and beyond that, uh, also with community development um, and, uh, and other things. And it's just so neat to see uh, the permaculture talk, the gardening talk, the self-sufficiency talk going beyond our circles in the homesteading realm. Uh, we, we all know about Mother Earth News. We all know about Grit Magazine. We all know, you know, about these, these magazines. We all know about these websites that they're in our circle and, and they're constantly talking about those things. It's just neat when you see it expanding out of those circles, introducing things like permaculture to people who've never heard of it. And or would never hear of it because they don't come into our circles. They stay out there. So I always get excited when I read uh, things like that. This article goes on to, um, you know, talk about uh, Bill Mollison and, and Toby Hemingway and, and David Holmgren and, um, and their books. And, uh, you know, I, I just find that fascinating when you see it kind of stepping out. Anyway, I'll put a link to the article. It's not a real in-depth article. It's basically just a what is it and uh, what can it do? And um, I think it's encouraging. I would encourage others to go and read it because I think if they see articles like this getting a lot of hits and getting a lot of response, it encourages other out-of-the-loop, so to speak, um, websites and magazines and things like that to start talking about this. Uh, because it's a hot topic. So I'll put a link in the show notes for that article. I think it's uh, worth checking out. And yeah, go check it out and uh, you know, uh, give them some traffic to that because I, I am extremely encouraged when I see things like that. Another uh, article I ran across, uh, this one is from uh, yakimaherald.com. It's, uh, it's a newspaper. Uh, Permaculture, can system of sustainable farming catch on locally? And they're just talking about the lo- the local impact of a permaculture farmer in their area in Yakima, Washington. Um, it's a good read. And and what I like is, again, here you have a newspaper picking up. Uh, they're picking up on something like permaculture. And they're talking about the, the impact it's having locally and, uh, and sustainable farming and the design features of permaculture and things like that. Again, exciting to me. I love it that it's it's becoming mainstream to talk about permaculture and gardening and sustainability. And uh, I, I'm just, uh, again, excited to see these kind of things, these kind of articles uh, making it out of our circles. So, again, check that article out. Both of those articles, um, I'll have uh, links in the show notes. Uh, this is episode 63, by the way, so you can go to smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 63 for the show notes of this uh, podcast episode. And um, check it out. Good good reads. Uh, like I said, not real in-depth, but encouraging because it's an introduction of these things to people who probably would never hear of it any other way. So, yeah, give them, give them, a, give them a click and uh, encourage them to keep writing articles like that. I wanted to also introduce a new segment to the podcast because... The Homestead Front Porch is our is our Facebook group, and you know it's a very active Facebook group. Uh, I think what are we up to? Like uh, nineteen thousand members, I think, in there, something like that. Uh, it's very fast growing group. Um, and it's very active, and you know what? I'm I'm very thankful for the interactions we have in there. So what I want to do is I want to introduce this new segment where, you know, I'm going to share a few things from the Facebook group, including a question that I'm going to ask the group before I do the podcast and let just read some of their answers. 
And uh, today's question is, what is something you know about homesteading now that you wish you had known when you started? And um, I think this could be a, it's a good thread. Uh, We've had quite a few people uh, post comments on it. And I think it's a good thread because especially for those who are uh, maybe just getting started or thinking about starting homesteading, uh, good, good, good things to know. I mean, something you wish you'd known in the beginning. I mean, so I guess it is for those who are beginning. Um, You know, I'm not going to, yeah, I'll 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 read some of these uh these uh last names, but I'm I'm horrible with last names, uh so I'll probably embarrass myself and some other people too as I read their last names because I'm just horrible at pronouncing names. But uh, and I should know some of their names because I talk to them quite often uh, on on uh, Facebook, uh, some of them. And uh, but there's some good good responses in here, and I wanted to share a few of them with you, um, Jackie. Uh, Again, I'm going to trash a last name possibly. Uh, Bissonette uh, says, she says, okay, nothing works out as planned. Be prepared for setbacks and try real hard to be patient. Tomorrow's a new day. I think that's some great advice because, uh, yeah, I've ended more than one day really discouraged <laughs> about what's going on. Um, Derek Nutt says, I don't know enough about enough, so find resources to learn and ask questions. And you know what? The Homestead Front Porch is a great place for that. And you know what? If you're not a member of that already, join. It's it's uh, it's a closed group, but all you have to do to join is ask. Now, we do ask three questions when you join. We'd like you to say yes to all three of those questions uh, before we let you in. And that's mostly just to weed out uh, maybe those who are joining for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Some people just, um, I don't know, they're, they're up to no good when they try to join your group. So those three questions help to eliminate a little bit of that. So answer the three questions and you can jump right into our group. We'll get you added right in. Um, Nicole Williams, uh, Nicole has a, uh, a podcast as well. Uh, she says, add one or two new things per year, especially as regards livestock, uh, as regards to livestock. And I agree with that because you can definitely, um, take on too much too soon. And uh, it 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 will definitely uh, overwhelm you at some point. So it's it's good advice from from Nicole. Uh, Amy Brown says it is a commitment, not a whim. It, you think you can jump into it and accomplish it in a day, uh, and accomplish it in a day. It's every day when you're tired, when it's raining, when it's snowing, it's setbacks and broken tools and frustrations until you learn what you did wrong and find a better way. It's hard, but it's rewarding, and it's a family affair. You can't be the only one in your home doing it all. It's the most beautiful and fulfilling, crazy hard work I've ever done, she says. And I think that's really good. Um, And it is a commitment, you know. it's There's days where I just go, man, I just, it'd be easier just to not do this. I mean, it'd be easier just to go to the grocery store. It'd be easier just to go out and eat, um, you know, and not have to worry about getting somebody to take care of your animals or what your garden when you go on vacation or, you know, something like that. And it is. It's a family thing, too. It can be very overwhelming. Uh, if you have to do it all yourself. Uh, Christine Farr says, I regret spending time and money on shrubbery and flowers when I should have been working on the garden and other edibles. And I understand I understand what she's saying there. Um, there's a lot of uh, things you could plant instead of those ornamental things that are going to give you some benefit. Now, I have actually kind of turned around a little bit on that. And uh, I've actually started to plant a lot more flowers and things like that now uh, because I... I I realize the benefit to the bees and drawing in um, other insects, uh, beneficial insects, and companion planting and how it can really help uh, intermixing some of those things in there. But I absolutely understand what she's saying. I mean, you can can put totally useless, fill your yard up with totally useless trees, shrubs, and flowers. Uh, Not so much the flowers, but everything else especially. And uh, when that room could most definitely be utilized for, um, for growing food. So... Uh, good point. Uh, Jacob Coomer uh, says, uh, start small and do a few things very well before trying to jump and do everything all at once. Great advice. Um, Morgan Smith, do it slowly. This is a theme, isn't it? Do it slowly. Do it, uh, you know, start small. These things are all, it's kind of a theme. A lot of people are saying that. Do it slowly and thoroughly. Uh, he, uh, she says, my least two favorite things when I get excited about new ideas I wish I had realized how overwhelming it would feel to have 12 different projects with no time, money, or energy to finish them. Stay focused, prioritize, and complete one project at a time. Great advice. Great advice. Jennifer Jackson, Jennifer, Dr. Doolittle Jackson, (laughs) How to Properly Store Food. 
Yeah, that's a good one because you can waste a lot of food if you don't know how to properly store the food. And I've done that, especially when I first started. Went through a lot of uh, waste. Throw it, throw it away a lot of food. Um, Tracy uh, Kuykendall, Kuykendall. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Sorry about that. Uh, sure wish I'd paid more attention when Grandpa and Grandma said anything or everything. Both moved to Texas as children in covered wagons, saw things like the world going from an agricultural homesteading society to a modern world we all take for granted. Good point. Um, there's a lot we can learn from our grandparents, and I wish I'd have paid a lot more attention to. Uh, Elizabeth Gardner says, understand and plan out your goals. Uh, the first year we had a homestead, we had five different kind of livestock and tried to have an enormous garden without understanding our land and soil. It was overwhelming, so we took a step back and reprioritized. Our first goal was to raise all our own meat. Done. Now we're focusing on fruits and vegetables, and we'd like to sustain our family for a year. Once that once that's met, we'll start focusing on either dairy or energy, etc., etc. We fell flat on our face the first year, and now we're on a better t- on a better path to sustainable living. Well, good for you, Elizabeth. And yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, lay out realistic goals and and again it's easy to overdo it take on too much and um, cause yourself a lot of harm and actually set yourself back by doing that so yeah good points uh, drew copeland says i'll tag on to the start slow theme we've got going on again yeah i agree and and second when planning out a garden plan on giving your rows a bit more spacing than what books seed packs friends tell you especially if you're a larger guy <laughs> Okay, um, and he goes on. Drew's not very good at following directions. I said one thing, but that's okay. That's okay, Drew. I understand. <laughs> uh, lastly, relax and be a bit flexible. I'm an engineer by trade, so I'm used to doing things precise. And with everything neat and orderly, uh, Mother Nature does what she wants when she wants. You know, I won't read all of his response. He's got a little bit lengthy here, but uh, I understand what he's saying there. Uh, I'm one of the people too. I like order. I like things to be in rows. I like things to be neat and straight. But I also like permaculture, and permaculture doesn't look neat and straight at all, you know. But I like to walk in the woods and see how nature sets things up. And I kind of had to develop a balance in that, you know, and and, and decide uh, kind of how to intermix the two. Like I got like my my raised beds are very neat and orderly, but then around trees and things like that, it looks more like a, a a permaculture food forest in some places, you know, where things are just kind of interspersed and put here and there. And, and I like that too. And, but I just find, I find what I can do is keep my edges clean. And that really helps to maintain that clean look that, uh, that Drew's uh, talking about there that he likes. And I like as well. So I, I do run my edges, uh, clean and, and within those, uh, edges, within those, uh, those gardening areas, it looks, uh, more like a forest in some sense. So, yeah, I understand what he's saying there. Rachel Jameson says, take the time to set attainable goals and don't let others steer you off those. That's some great advice right there because it's really easy to get derailed (laughs) from your original plans. Uh, Troy McClung says, plant fruit trees immediately. That goes back to the old saying, the best time to plant a tree uh, 10 years ago, the second best time is today. So, uh, yeah, plant your fruit trees, get them going because they're going to, take a little bit to produce and a little while and you want to get those going pretty quick so i understand uh what he's saying there um next we have a really lengthy one from uh david i'm gonna trash your last name uh david de uh david's pretty active in the group i should know you how to pronounce your last name but i'm sorry i don't um he actually he's not a very good direction follower either he he listed four things i'll give you the four things but he had quite a bit to write about each one of those things Uh, Number one, the role that biodiversity can play. Uh, Number two, the degree of economic and social isolation. Number three, build it right once. And number four, build in as much automation as possible. Uh, You can go and read that. I have a link to this uh, actual thread in Facebook. If you're part of the group, you you can click on it and read it. I'll put that link in the show notes. But you can go and read what he had. He had some great things to say in each one of those areas. And I understand what he's saying. And uh, I've, after reading it, I've, and another post that David has written, um, David's a lot smarter than me. 
<laughs> a lot more educated for sure. And uh, he has a lot to say about a lot of great things to say about a lot of things. So check out what he had to say about those things. If you're, if you're interested, uh, Samantha Everett, uh, don't procrastinate, just do it. Oh, wow. That, yeah, the old Nike slogans coming out and it applies. No doubt about it. And, you know, um, procrastination, um, <laughs> I'm a go-getter. Let me just say that. I'm a go-getter when I feel like going and getting. <laughs> but when I don't feel like it, I got to make myself. And procrastination can take hold, and I don't want to do anything. So, yeah, I understand what you're saying there. Just get out and start moving. Start working. Um, you know, it, once you get the ball rolling, it'll stay rolling. But once it stops, it's hard to get it rolling again. So just get it rolling. That's all you got to do. Uh, Rachel uh, chimed in with some other things. She said also, Rachel Jamison that is, she also says, also don't limit yourself monetarily. Sometimes you are blessed with opportunities you'd never be able to afford. We could never afford a horse and have nowhere to keep it. But due to hard work and determination, my daughter borrowed a horse from a rescue, learned how to rehab it, and showed it all week at the county fair. The cost, lots of love and time. She did pay for her own lessons. And, you know, that that's a good point. Um... I think a lot of people think, well, I can't homestead. Matter of fact, I had this conversation with a lady last week on the phone. And we were talking about homesteading. And she said, I could never afford to do that right now. Because she's just in a situation. She feels like she couldn't afford it. And I said, oh, um, you, you, yeah, you can't afford to do everything. And maybe not everything perfectly. But there are things you can do. There's a lot of DIY projects. There's a lot of uh, recycling and repurposing you can do. And as this example that Rachel gave us, there's just opportunities, uh, you know, are out there to uh, to take advantage. I mean, I see I see free animals on Craigslist occasionally. You know, people just need to get rid of stuff. I mean, you just you don't know. You don't know what opportunities are going to present themselves if you just look for them. So I agree. You know, you can limit yourself uh, monetarily. Um, Kim Strum jumped in and said, "Failure is only a failure if you do not learn from it." And uh, in the beginning, it can be hard and you feel like you fail in so many areas, but they are all just learning lessons. I think I learned more from one fail than five than five times when I succeed on the first try. And, uh, yep, I agree. I always learn way faster from my mistakes than I do from accidentally getting it right. <laughs> Um, Lori Herbert, uh, says, I am pretty sure that planting asparagus means that you will be moving within the next year. Yeah. Yeah. You plant those perennial things and, and, uh, they're there, you know, and, uh, if you move, you have to start over with those things, but, uh, yeah, you can't, you can't always think about that, but she, I, that was, I think that was a funny, but, uh, she has, she goes on to say some, some real good advice. Also preserving, canning, dehydrating, and using what you put up. Nothing tastes better than fresh garden veggies in the winter. I wasted so much in my first few gardening years, and so did I. We talked about that a few minutes ago. And, yeah, preservation is and preparation of your food is so important. It's such an important homesteading skill. And uh, I'll tell you, it's not my favorite part, especially the preservation part. Canning is not my favorite thing to do. I mean, the kitchen work is not my favorite thing to do, but it is vital. It is so important. And you need to know how to do it. Corey Barrer. <laughs> Corey Barrer says, I know I'm probably ha hacking up your last name pretty bad there. Uh, how to adjust chores and housing and housing to how fast your farm can grow if you take on too many animals too quickly. Again, growing too fast is, you know, that's a theme here. You got to be slow about it. You can't overdo it. And I, I'm guilty of that. Um, Lana Jackson uh, had a great, uh, comment. She says, make a community for yourself. This isn't a solo lifestyle. Uh, you will need support when your truck dies. Uh, you get too ill or injured to take care of animals. There will always be an animal which does something that you've never uh, seen or read about before. Uh, you're also going to need a, to build a list of contacts. She goes on to talk a little bit about this. Uh, she was actually on the podcast a few months ago, and she talked a lot about this on, on the podcast episode that she's in. Look that up, uh, Lana Jackson. It was an interview with her and her homestead. Uh, we heard about her homestead, and she talks a lot about that, you know, uh, having folks help her out when she was sick or hurt. And, um, yeah, I'll read that. It's good stuff there. It's good advice, uh, Lana. Uh, Heather Eby um, says <laughs> something she wished she knew in the beginning was that I'd be tired all the time. <laughs> 
<laughs> the homesteading is 90% dealing with poop. That it is <laughs> that it is possible to provide a majority of the family's food, that it feels great to eat fresh food that I know the origins of from start to finish, that in spite of being tired and dealing with poop, I wouldn't trade this life for any other. <laughs> that's right. That's good. That's really good. I And I agree. There's a lot of things that when you're doing them, you think this is, this is not the best thing. You know, this is not what I really was had in mind when I started this thing. But in the end, you go, yeah, it's worth it. You know, and I enjoy it. So great point, Heather. Uh, Savannah Elias, um, she says, slow down. Building a homestead is a process, uh, not an event. We got rushed with way too many projects, got overwhelmed, and ended up being behind. And again, there's that there's that thing again, isn't it? Slow down, one thing at a time. Uh, Lisa Ballesta says, learn as much as you can before you start. Start small, expand slowly. This is your new job, and like any career, you just take a person... You just can't take a person and dump them into a new position with, with no training. We come from worlds that move fast around us, and so we try to keep up that pace, but things move slower on the homestead, and you get to make your own pace. Good advice. Um, seems like my life still moves pretty fast, but it probably shouldn't. <laughs> and there you have it. There's some of the responses. I think people are still going to be adding more to that as time goes. I'm doing this podcast a little earlier, and uh, there's going to be more added, I'm sure. And uh, there's also some comments below each one of those things. And if you want to hear read some of them more in detail than what I read them out. Uh, there Anyway, there's just some things from the front porch. Um, also, there's a lot of people posting their harvest. There's a lot of people uh, that talk about issues they're having. There's a great picture of someone digging a big old giant copperhead snake out of their garden. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff in the Homestead Front Porch. If you're not part of it, come on over, be a part. Just search Facebook for the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group. We'd love to have you in there and be part of things. So check it out. On to other things. Let's jump into our main topic of discussion for the day. Creating and utilizing microclimates. What is a microclimate? Well, simply put, it is the climate of a very small or restricted area, especially when that area differs from the climate of the surrounding area. Um, now, microclimates, they can allow for the growing of plants in an area, that normally would not grow in that hardiness zone or in the season, the current season of that area. Uh, microclimates are created and vary due to soil, uh, water, weather, sun, and warmth. And, and the variances in these areas can be caused by many reasons, uh, including the garden direction, exposure to wind, slopes, berms, uh, structures and overhangs, topography of the land, the soil drainage, along with a whole list of other factors. We'll talk about a little bit of that here in a few minutes. But that's just basically what a microclimate is. It's 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 a climate in a small scale. I mean, it's not... You walk outside and it's 72 and sunny and it's the average temperature of your area this time of the year. You might go to one part of your yard and it'd be cooler. You might go to another part of your yard and it might feel warmer because the sun's beating on it all day and the ground might be dry and where the wind blows across it, it might be really dry dirt. You might have another part of your yard that's a little bit lower and moisture and it holds moisture better and 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 just different you might have a shady area from a tree that's a lot cooler uh we know about microclimates i mean when we go out to a fishing hole what do we do we grab our lawn chair or, or uh, find us a log to set on under a shade tree and you know and, and do some fishing because it's cooler there you got a breezy area you got some shade it's going to be a lot cooler uh, again we're no different than our vegetables okay uh lettuce doesn't like to be out in bright sun all day in the middle of summer. It will wilt, it will bolt, and it won't do very well for you. It'll have be of a bitter taste and whatnot. So you need to find a microclimate on your property if you're going to grow uh, lettuce in July and August. So, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about some of that, but that's what a microclimate is. Uh, and it's real important, I feel, to locate those, those microclimates on your homestead. Now, it, whether you're an urban homesteader or you have a large homestead, out in the country, it really applies to you because there's going to be certain things that grow well in certain places. And you want to locate the microclimates on your property. Now, you can also make your own microclimates, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But I think it's important to know what you're looking for as far as locating microclimates on your property. Uh, and some of the factors I mentioned a minute ago are going to determine that. Uh, you're going to want to look at like the direction of a garden. Like, what are you going to plant there and the direction of it? 
uh, north, south, east, and west. I mean, if it's on the north side, it's going to receive the least amount of sun. Uh, it's going to have more moisture in summer, but it's going. But the frost is, may linger there. You know, ferns and similar plants are probably going to thrive in a place like that. But things like tomatoes, peppers, they're not. They're going to do horrible in an area like that. So. Uh, you know, you're going to have to pay attention to the direction of your garden. South facing, it has a longer growing season. It's warm and sunny in the winter. And, you know, things like peppers and tomatoes are going to do great in an area like that. All day sun, really hot. It's going to do great. Um, and, and, again, the west is going to be the same way. Hot, hot, hot during that time of the year. Uh, drier, windier. Uh, at least here in North America, it's going to be the windier side usually. Uh, wind generally generally is traveling west to east. Um, so you're just going to get hit with the, the wind most of the, mostly it's going to get hit with the evening sun, the hot sun every evening. It's going to create like a Mediterranean environment. Again, tomatoes, peppers, things that need really hot, uh, uh dry soil is going to do pretty well in those areas. Now, East, if you're on the East side, you're going to have morning sun, you're going to have less wind, especially if you have some, some blockage uh, something blocking that area. Uh, it's going to be good for plants that prefer like full sun to part shade, um, and, and don't, don't want to be really hot, but need the full sun. You know, they want the, they want the sunlight exposure, but they don't need the heat exposure. They're going to be, uh, they're going to, the ground's going to be a little bit more moist because you're not going to have the wind blowing across it quite as hard. It's going to be just slightly better than West. South and, and West are going to be your, your hottest part. East is going to be your next best. North's going to be very limited on what you can grow in the Northern part. It's going to take some shade tolerant, uh, depending on what you have in that area, of course, but, uh, you know, uh, north of your house, north of your trees, north sides of your properties, generally, that's going to make a big difference. Plants you plant on the, to the south of that, that might shade it out. I mean, all these things are going to factor in. So you have to pay attention to garden direction. Um, again, exposure to wind is something you got to look for in your property. Do you have areas of your property that are more exposed to wind? Cause that ground's going to be drier. Um, again, the West Southwest, these areas are going to probably be the parts that get um, the drier soil. And and some herbs just thrive in those areas. You know, things like uh, lavender and some of the grasses and rosemary and things like that love that, that kind of thing. They love the so dry soil conditions. Slopes and berms. Top of a slope can be windy and drier. And the steeper the slope, the drier the soil. Um, the bottoms of a slope, especially on the uh, east side, are probably going to collect a lot of moisture. Uh, and, and may not be good for a lot of plants. Uh, they're going to they're have some wet feet and have some wet roots. And they're also going to maybe create cold air pockets at the bottom of the slopes. And um, so, I mean, you basically, you just want to, you want to feel it out at different times of the day, see what it's like in those areas. Just kind of just, just feel out the area. You know, you have to walk a property. You have to know your property. Um, I live in an urban homestead. And I've lived here for 25 years. I know my property pretty well. But I'm going to tell you, I've completely changed the environments on my property. When I first moved here, for the first 20 years I lived here, it was grass. When I first moved here, there were two trees on the property. One at the very back and one at the very front. And both of them came down within a couple of years. One was interfering with power lines and the other one <laughs> got diseased and died. Then I had no trees. I had no shade other than the buildings. And then over the, these last few years planted several trees. We've actually created microclimates, put in ponds. We'll talk all about that in a few minutes, things I've done. But again, the microclimates have changed. So you want to know your property and you want to examine it and you want to, you know, you need to pay attention over a year too. I mean, it takes time to find these microclimates. You're going to know after winter, which spots the, the uh, snow melts first. You're going to see frost developing in some parts of your yard and some parts that won't have the frost. And when there's a frost uh, in the heart of summer, you're going to notice some of the soil in certain areas of your yard remain has moisture in it more so than other parts that'll get dry and cracked. You'll get to know your property over time. You want to pay special attention to those things. Write them down. Get you a piece of graph paper. Map out your property. Write down, uh, draw everything that's on your property on that graph paper, and then to different sides of each one of those items, like a tree or a house or a garage or or whatever, sidewalks, uh, uh, driveways, anything. Because these things can all play a part, as we'll talk about here in a minute, on structures in it. So have you some graph paper laid out and, and try to understand the microclimates all around that property on, a gra on some graph paper. Uh, again, structures and overhangs, that's something I want to talk about here. They can create uh, a lot of changes. I mean, overhangs and eaves can, can provide some frost, sun, and rain protection. But they can actually cause drier areas too, especially to the east of a home. If your wind's blowing 
uh, from the west to the east on your on the east side of your house. You got an even an overhang. A lot of that water's blowing right past that area and it ain't coming back. And um, you're probably gonna have a dry area there. So I mean, it can create a dry area, drier soil. Uh, it can also create some pretty deep shade on the north side of a home. So be aware of that. Hence, uh, hedges, fences, and walls provide good wind protection, but they can also cast shadows and um, create sun pockets on south or west side. So um, be aware of that. They can also provide a heat sink, though. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll mention that here in a minute. So they can store some heat. And, and again, we'll get to that when we get down to heat sinks. Um, trees, uh, they can provide a canopy of leaves. Uh, and what they can do is they can provide shade or a dappled sunlight, which can be really beneficial uh, depending on what you're growing. Um, again, they can produce the, uh, they can reduce the likelihood of frost. They can also act as a wind barrier, but depending on what country they are, they may actually reduce soil moisture if they're, if the roots are taking too much of the soil from, or too much of the moisture from the soil. So that makes a difference as well. Uh, structures, they can reflect and hold heat. They can deflect wind and cast shadows. And depending on the direction of the sun, can be um, they can be a protected microclimate for cold sensitive plants or shadier area for ferns. Um, also, the color of that structure can have an impact on the heat absorption and radiation. So be aware of that. Uh, cold air traps, cold air it pools in low spots and behind north facing structures. Uh, so check landscape for frost in the early morning temperatures is around 32 degrees. Now I'll kind of tell you where your cold pockets are. Again, now we're going to get back to heat sinks. Uh, heat sinks, they can absorb heat and then re-radiate that heat at night, increasing night temperatures. Now this is really helpful, especially in the early spring and late fall when you start getting those really cool nights, and it can really reduce your frost impact. It can also increase the temperature of sunny areas negatively, impacting close growing plants so if you've got some plants that don't handle heat that well you probably don't want to plant them especially on the south side of a home uh, or west side of a home right up against your walls because it can actually have a negative effect on those so be aware of that soil moisture is another thing to think about soil composition um, soil moisture is determined by the proportions of clay sand and loam you have uh, clay holds the most and sand the least moisture so that's just something to keep in mind uh, drainage pattern does water you have to take into consideration does water uh, from rainfall flow onto your land or away from it where does it pool you know because if there's obviously if there's pooling water that's going to be a problem unless you're growing rice right <laughs> uh, so you want to you want to pay attention to those kind of areas uh, but you also want to watch out for extremely dry areas as a lot of things can't handle you know dry cracked soil unless you're in a desert uh, growing desert type plants pay attention to uh, competition from neighboring plants you need to know the the water requirements of surrounding plants and uh, whether they have shallow or deep roots these can you know it can have an effect on one or the other and there's and this is where companion planting comes in really important which is a whole another topic that we've covered before but you want to pay attention to those things. So there's just some of the things you can look for around a property. So again, you're going to pay attention to structures. You're going to pay attention to um, to uh, trees. You're going to pay attention to boulders, ponds, uh, elevation. Like even a raised bed is going to have a different microclimate than the ground right next to it. A, a raised bed is going to create drier soil, and it's going to heat up faster in the day. So I mean, you're going to, it, it, even a raised bed is creating a microclimate. So um, there's a lot of things you can do when you're looking for microclimates. But let's talk a little bit about creating microclimates. Now, to create a microclimate, you simply need to mimic what causes microclimates naturally. And this can be done by adding things like trees, boulders, ponds, berms. Um, some of the things I've done around here, as I just mentioned, I did put in a pond. We put in a small decorative pond. But this thing creates a wonderful um, little uh, microclimate. And it's not just a microclimate for the plants. It's also a microclimate for for the beneficial insects. And that's probably more, and animals, uh, frogs, snakes, you know, just a lot of insects that are drawn to that. So it creates this nice little microclimate uh, for those animals and those insects and those plants around it as well. I have a lot of plants around it as well. Um, trees. Uh, I South side of my house, very hot. I mean, it gets all day sun, beat, the heat just beats on it all day, right up against my house. And yet I have a whole bunch of stuff planted there that does really, really well. Why does it do well? Because just a few feet to the south of it, 
I planted a fruit tree, a semi-dwarf, either pear or apple. I kind of alternated them down through there. And a cherry tree. I got some cherry trees there too. Down through that fence row right alongside my house on a few feet south of where I have those plants. And what this does is it creates a dappled shade throughout the day on those on those plants, which helps out with that little microclimate. I want to grow lettuce year-round. I can't do that in my raised beds. They're out there on the south side of my property, out in the wide open sun, all day long. Um, it'll bolt. It'll be bitter. It'll be horrible all summer long. I can grow it early spring, late fall. So what do I do? I put a little small raised bed on the very northwest, I'm sorry, northeast side of my property, just to the east of a um, mulberry tree. And this provides evening shade, so it blocks out that hot sun in the evening. It is an area of my property, because it's that far up in that part of my property, it's getting very little wind. It's a lot cooler up there, but it's not drying out the soil because of the wind either. Um, so the soil staying more moist. It's raised a little bit off the ground. Just uh, It's a small raised bed. It's only like a 12-inch raised bed. Uh, it's low to the ground, so it's maintaining a cool area. It's a cooler part of my property. I grew lettuce in that bed all summer. And it's just now going to bolt. And it's after the third cutting. It's starting to bolt a little bit. It's worked out great. And this is the, these are the kind of things you can do with microclimates. Um, I was talking earlier about my tomatoes and how the blight resistance. Well, you know, there is a microclimate in my greenhouse that provides ideal growing conditions for tomatoes. I'm utilizing that. It ain't natural. It's something I put in, but it's a microclimate. It's a whole different microclimate in that greenhouse, and it works great uh, for tomatoes, peppers, things like that. These are these are what you got to keep in mind when you start creating a microclimate. You can build a little rock wall out in, in a property somewhere. It's going to hold heat, uh, depending on what part of the country, and you might want to develop, you know, build something that's going to hold heat. You're in a hot part of the country. You might want to provide shade. You need to start putting things up to provide shade. Um, I know some folks that they grow cucumbers. Uh, on up a trellis and then they plant to the a um, little bit to the north east of that cucumber trellis that's where they plant their lettuce so as the cucumbers climb the trellis then the lettuce by the time those are up the heat starts getting really hot in the summertime they got lettuce there shading it out in the evening it does a lot better these are the kind of things you got to keep in mind when you're creating microclimates and um, you know this is the same concept as as a herb spiral an herb spiral creates these microclimates all the way up it, and certain herbs growing better on certain parts of that spiral. Stuff up high has drier feet, it's drier soil, it's a lot hotter. Um, you go around to the east side, it's not it's, the, the soil is going to be a little cooler, but again, you still dry high up. And as you rotate your way down and the heat on the south side, uh, on the west side, you're going to have that, that hotter, more moist areas down below. And certain herbs are going to respond different to certain areas of that herb spiral. Again, you're creating a microclimate in an herb spiral. And and I think that utilizing microclimates on every homestead is, is it can so increase your your um, your harvest every year and, and actually make gardening a lot more enjoyable because you're not constantly battling the heat or the cold or whatever you're facing. You're making it easier to grow by creating these microclimates. So I think that you need to utilize those microclimates. Identify what plants you want to grow, what those plants like, then find or create a microclimate that best fits that plant, um, like I did for my lettuce and like I've done for other vegetables on my property. So there you have it. There's microclimates in a nutshell. I would encourage you to uh, go down this line of thinking when you're walking around your property and try to identify. Just take a notepad out with you or some graph paper, and try to find microclimates on your property. See if you can identify some. And uh, and then just kind of decide, hmm, I wonder what would grow good there, and kind of think about what grows good in those conditions, uh, in those microclimates. So there you have it, folks. There is the uh, creating and utilizing microclimates on your property. I wanted to, uh, here at the end, uh, recommend, uh, give you a couple recommendations. You know what, I, I a product. Here's something that I think everybody should have. And that is a salad spinner. Well, one of my daughters bought me a salad spinner a while back, and it's a Starfrit salad spinner. It's a four, five quart capacity. I'll put a link to it in the show notes because uh, you know I like to recommend things that I really like. And I was just using this thing the other day, and I was thinking I need to tell folks about this thing because this is like the best salad spinner I've ever had. <laughs> it's got the crank on the side, and it spins super fast. It's just it works really well. 
uh, I highly recommend this uh, this salad spinner. So uh, you can dry that salad, that lettuce out. I go out and pick my fresh lettuce. I wash it off. I toss it in that. Give it a few spins, and hey, we're eating we're eating dry salad, which is great, you know. So uh, get yourself a salad spinner, and that's a good one right there. It's one I can recommend because I have it. Uh, not because I went out and bought it, but uh, one of my children bought it for me, and I love it. Love it, love it. I will also recommend a book uh, called The Resilient Farm and Homestead. It's an innovative permaculture and whole systems design approach by Ben Falk. Um, we talked a lot about uh, microclimates today, and he has a bit to say about that and and other permaculture practices as well. So it's a great book. You should check it out. Um, I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show today. And uh, remember, the show notes for this episode can be found at smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 63. And, uh, and happy homesteading, and God bless. Thanks for listening. To see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes, go to smalltownhomestead.com. There you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow.